I'm Eve Ann Boland, and I've been fortunate enough to be here in these beautiful botanical gardens to honor Edna St. Vincent Millay in the groundbreakers project of the garden that is in, in uh, association with the Poetry Society of America. It's a wonderful project, and I, I've been delighted to be associated with it. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted and honored to be here. And first of all, I want to give my my thanks to uh, Alice Quinn, who has been such a friend to poetry since the very beginning and long before I knew her. And it's she who really brought forward this event and was kind enough to, to bring me into it. And also my thanks uh, to the Botanical Gardens with their wonderful project of doing this. And I, I, what I want to do today is, in a way, uh, Alice and I, and the gardens indeed, the committee, uh, chose the poems that are on the walk, that you, when you go around the gardens and you see these, these poems will be the ones you see. But I wanted to, to read them because really, those poems make a chronology of the complicated and important and really defining figure that Edna St. Vincent Millay is. I, I was very touched listening to Alice, Alice describe her aunt's connection to Malay. Many people found Malay for themselves. Many people read Malay and loved Malay, and they must have been puzzled that the, the critique that often protects a poet and lifts a poet into a kind of pantheon where we look at them and we realize their importance for, for some reason, that didn't exist for Malay, and that's a little bit, I'll mention that a little bit more today. But let me begin by saying, start at the beginning and, and speak a little bit about Malay's beginnings, because they're very important, and they're even important to what you'll see in the garden. Um, Edna St. Vincent Malay was born in, uh, Rockport, in Rockport, Maine, and there were three children who were girls in that family, and her father deserted the family when she was about six years of age. He was never a figure afterwards in, in her life. She describes him briefly in a comment as saying that he, um, uh, she remembers him as a distant figure leaving them going across a cranberry field. She had a remarkable mother called Cora Millay who raised these three vivid girls. But it was a very hard-pressed family. Uh, the, the, their mother worked several jobs. Uh, they, they, there would not have been, and in this, I think there were a lot of similarities to Irish situations. There really would not have been a chance of education for those girls had a sort of strange circumstance not happened. Um, there's a hotel that used to be called the Whitehall, I think. It was, it was founded in, in just up from Penobscot Bay in Camden, Maine. Uh, at the end of the High Street in Camden, Maine, there was a hotel that's now called the Whitehall Inn that then was called Whitehall. It was made in the first decade of, of uh, the 1900s for sort of prosperous figures from New York to come and take the sea breezes from Maine. So you almost have to imagine a stream of Wharton characters coming into uh, this hotel and being there. Millay's sister was in the hotel and she worked there during the summer. At the end of that summer, there was to be a recitation. And that recitation was to be by the girls who worked in the hotel. And her sister asked Millay to come up there and to recite. Now, I was actually in that hotel once, years ago, or very nearly uh, 20 years ago, and went up to the hotel, and the man behind that counter took out a, a huge um, file, photographs and letters that I only saw briefly. But I do remember seeing there the piano stool, and that's my memory, um, of, of Malay sat, as I remember the record, on that piano stool, and she recited something. And that had a huge consequence for Malay, and I'll give you just the first sort of lines of what she recited. It was a poem called Renaissance. She was about 20 years of age at this point. 
So the lines were, all I could see from where I stood was three long mountains and a wood. I turned and looked another way and saw three islands in a bay. So with my eyes, I traced the line of the horizon, thin and fine, straight around till I was come back to where I'd started from. And all I saw from where I stood was three long mountains and a wood. Those really beautiful, clean lines of observation made a woman come up to her. It's a much longer poem that she recited. A woman called Caroline Dow, who coordinated scholarships in New York. And between them, they arranged that Malay would go to Vassar, which she did. Uh, I, I think at the age of 21, she entered Vassar. Without that strange circumstance, she would not have had that opportunity. And so Malay went from being this sort of local girl uh, to going to Vassar on the strength of this poem. And in 1917, uh, the, the, the volume Renaissance came out and Malay, who had been born in 1892, I mean, this, this is when really Malay's career began. So I always think of that particular poem, the opening to that poem, as very much a signature look in Malay because she's looking out at nature She's admiring that view. And though you see these poems in the garden, Millet never wants to constrain nature. She never wants to take nature back. She never wants to be an ornamental gardener. And the, the first poem that you see in the garden walk, or, or one of the poems that you will see, is called Afternoon on a Hill. And it is related to this hill in Penobscot Bay. And it says, you know, I will be the gladdest thing under the sun. I will touch a hundred flowers and not pick one. I will look at cliffs and clouds with quiet eyes, watch the wind bow down the grass and the grass rise. And when lights begin to show up from the town, I will mark which must be mine and then start down. I always think of that poem as very typical of what Millet did with the lyric. It's a deceptively sort of simple poem with a deceptively rich self-portrait. It has Millet there on that hill looking down, thinking that those, you know, uh, I will touch a hundred flowers and not pick one. The person who observes nature and loves nature, but is not going to contain it. And if that is true about her relationship to nature, it's also true for good and ill about her relationship to her own nature. You know, Millet, when she left, um, she, when she left Vassar, she became a sort of young bohemian in Greenwich Village. We are hugely indebted to a not unmixed essay by Edmund Wilson for giving a, a view of the young Millet. She was beautiful, charismatic, very much the center of all eyes in Greenwich Village. But I have to tell you a little story that has always puzzled me about that. When I was about 21 or 22 years of age, I was in Dublin, and a woman who had been married to an Irish patriot who had died but a, an, an American woman who was connected to a number of significant families asked if she, she, she was a sculptor, and she was really coming into Dublin and sculpting a lot of people. She asked if she could do a sculpture of, of me, and I was around and about. She was friendly with my mother. And so she came in, into town, and she did this sculpture. And she spoke to me about poetry. She wasn't herself a huge reader of poetry, but she said to me, you know, my mother, was a great reader of poetry, she said. And she used to have people come up and read in our front room in New York. And there was this poet, she said, who had an amazing reading voice. And she would come and she wore long skirts. And then she said, it was Edna St. Vincent Millay. So these two contradictory images of Millay 
exist. She did indeed go and read poetry. She was very hard pressed. She was a young actress. She was a young writer. She wasn't making any money. She was trying to survive. There was no support from home. There weren't arts councils. And so she is, is in that uh, fast paced, rackety life in Greenwich Village. And that's where we first see Malay in all her vividness. And it's plain that Malay is a, a complicated mixture of really fiery energy and charismatic um, effect, but also quite a complicated and stressed person living in the village, breaking a lot of hearts uh, in a very cavalier way, a lot of relationships with a lot of men who are discarded. Edmund Wilson was one of them, hence the essay. Um, but she writes, you know, in, in a book called Second to April, it's actually her third book, not her second. Uh, she writes um, a, a poem also here in the garden uh, called City Trees. It's, you know, um, you know, Edmund Wilson in his essay says this about Malay. He says, her poetry is not the work of a being for whom life could ever have been easy or gone along at a comfortable level it will always give the lie to any too respectful biography, but it will always be there to make the casualties of her life seem unimportant. And I, I, I think that is true. I think it's true that though Malay's life had a lot of bumpy stretches, these poems. Now, City Trees is another poem. It's here in the garden. It's another poem that is really worth sort of keeping your eye on because here is Malay marking out, and these external things Malay is writing about are marking out an interior life with a considerable struggle between freedom and not freedom. So she imagines that these trees are in the city. She imagines that nobody can really understand them but herself. She imagines they're not like country trees, but they make the same small sound as country trees. And so this is, again, a 12-line signature lyric. Um, this one comes from this book, Second April. The trees along the city street, save for the traffic and the trains, would make a sound as thin and sweet as trees in country lanes. And people standing in their shade out of a shower undoubtedly would hear such music as is made upon a country tree. Old oh, little leaves that are as dumb against the shrieking city air. I want you when the wind has come. I know what sound is there. So here, here is Malay able to translate the trees. And I think that poem shows, you know, when we're in the beautiful botanical gardens, there are all kinds of ways of being a gardener. But Malay's way was not the conventional way. Malay didn't really go into the garden as the grower of things. She really, in, in the poems that you'll see in the garden, she went into the garden to find companions. And she has an intimate relation with those companions. And those companions are the flowers and the trees contained in the garden, but reminding her of freedom. When I finish, I'm going to read this ex beautiful poem, one of her last poems of, of going into a garden and she's talking to the, the, the plants that are in the garden. And she says to them, you know, I have other things to do than come here and look at you. You know, one of them is writing poetry, you know. And so she goes out to rebuke the tree, you know, the flowers for not growing properly. But it's, it's a, a dialogue that is sort of different. You know, in 1920, Millet wrote a book that she herself was a little bit distanced from, she called it light verse, called A Few Figs from Thistles. Came out with Mitchell Kennelly, had a bright green cover, uh, sold a thousand copies in a, in a heartbeat. And here we can bring up one of the problems of Malay, which is the problems of her reputation. Um, Malay was a, a very popular poet, but she did stand on the dangerous edge of modernism. Uh, when you think that after a few figs from thistles, I think eight months later, T.S. Eliot's Wasteland was published. 
Millet is one of the last of the poets we look at with a sort of 19th century configuration who makes a partnership with the audience so the audience almost feels that they have co-authored some of these poems. That's true of the lovely quatrain that Alice read, which I'll read briefly again. My candle burns at both ends. It will not last the night, but are my foes and oh my friends. It gives a lovely light. And so you have this kind of sense of Malay writing things that inscribe themselves deep into the jazz age. Um, but that dangerous threshold of modernism goes against her. It goes against her eventually because modernism is so often described and officially described as the reintegration of intellect into poetry and it's one of its signature achievements. But that wasn't what Malay wanted to do. It wasn't what her instinct was to do. It wasn't who she was. Um, one of the poems here in the garden is called Daphne. And just as Alice said, Malay thought of herself as a new woman um, as reversing all the romantic inscriptions of what women should do, above all reversing the passivity of what women are. Daphne draws on the legend. Daphne's the daughter in the legend of a river god. And she's chased by Apollo, who just really wants to catch up with her, have his way with her, discard her. And she can see Apollo coming, Daphne. And she calls out to her father for help. And all he can do because he's a much less powerful god than Apollo. So all he can do for her is turn her into a laurel tree. So in this poem, that Millet is not interested in that variant of the legend at all. It's a charming, you know, um, Millet-ish poem. Uh, Why do you follow me? It's called, it's called Daphne. Why do you follow me? Any moment I can be nothing but a laurel tree. Any moment of the chase, I can leave you in my place a pink bow for your embrace. Yet, if over hill and hollow, still it be your will to follow, I am off to heal Apollo. Um, you know, the, the, that little book with its bright green cover is succeeded by Second April, I think a slightly darker book. And in this book, she starts to write, if you look very closely, you will see Malay for the first time writing about the cost of her gift, the cost of being a poet. Millet didn't have much wish to be a very conventional woman. But on the other hand, she didn't wish to be destabilized in the world. And there were ways in which she could feel herself becoming destabilized. This is a really lovely poem. It's again here in the Botanic Gardens. It's called Assault. She goes out one night and she hears the frogs. And it's the beginning of spring, and she hears these loud, loud frogs to remind her that it's spring. And she says, you know, why do I have to come out here and be confronted by that beauty? And, and the, the references where she says, oh, savage beauty, suffer me to pass. This is one of the first times you hear Malay thinking of the gift and of the cost of it to her psychically. I had forgotten how the frogs must sound after a year of silence. Else I think I should not so have ventured forth alone at dusk upon this unfrequented road. I am waylaid by beauty. Who will walk between me and the crying of the frogs? O oh, savage beauty, suffer me to pass, that I'm a timid woman on her way from one house to another. Was Millet a timid woman? I don't know, but it's not impossible that there's some part of Malay that shrank from the figure that she was, a, a very public, very noted, slightly scandalous, all of that. Uh, there's a wonderful poem in this book. The, one of the nicest poems in A Few Figs from Thistles is called Portrait by a Neighbor. Malay imagines her neighbor writing about her and considering her very eccentric considering her, you know, borrowing sugar and giving back cream and going out in the moonlight and, and uh, growing her lettuces. The person, um, the she in the poem, of course, is written by Malay, but she wants you to think this is a neighbor looking at her. And, and I think, you know, it's one of the things that are really worth looking at. Malay doesn't usually put a very self-important persona 
into her work. There's often a kind of self-deprecating persona in both her best sonnets and in this kind of charming throwaway poem. Before she has her floor swept or her dishes done, any day you'll find her sunning in the sun. It's long after midnight, her key is in the lock, and you never see her chimney smoke till past 10 o'clock. She digs in her garden with a shovel and a spoon. She weeds her lazy lettuce by the light of the moon. She walks up the walk like a woman in a dream. She forgets she borrowed butter and pays you back cream. Her lawn looks like a meadow, and if she mows the place, she leaves the clover standing and the Queen Anne's lace. It's one of the most charming and heartening little portraits of Malay, this eccentric neighbor who goes out and weeds the grass by moonlight and doesn't come in till late and doesn't light her fire properly. And it, it has this really charming, heartening um, uh, feel to it. These, these are the great years for Edna St. Vincent Malay. From 1917 to probably a little bit around 1925. Um, the, the world darkens somewhat. But one poem in A Few Figs from Thistles really captures this sort of great moment of hers when she's, you know, Arthur Llewellyn Powers, who was in love with her as well in the city, he was an editor. He said she was this beautiful girl who had this very rash nature. Well, she wanted to inscribe a figure who was bold and libertarian and broke away, even broke away from the life her mother had lived. Um, so the poem that really describes it is a poem called Recuerdo. And it, in, in 1918, a friend, another disappointed uh, boyfriend, really, Arthur Fick, who, who she had discarded, um, came back into New York with a friend and to visit her. Together with the friend, they rode the Staten Island Ferry all night, back and forwards, uh, until the dawn. And you know, Millay talked about her life in New York and said that it was very, very poor and very, very merry. And that's the spirit that gets into this really wonderful piece of work, especially its second stanza. So the, the idea of this exuberant life, you know, where nobody's timed by the clocks, where they get on the Staten Island Ferry. I think I looked up the Staten Island Ferry and it cost 10 cents, 25 cents, something, something like that. Anyway, it wasn't the most expensive evening. And, um, and, and she left this record of it. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. It was bare and bright and smelled like a stable. But we looked into a fire. We leaned across a table. We lay on a hilltop underneath the moon. And the whistles kept blowing. And the dawn came soon. We were very tired, we were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry, and you ate an apple, and I ate a pear, from a dozen of each we had bought somewhere. And the sky went wan, and the wind came cold, and the sun rose dripping, a bucket full of gold. We were very tired, we were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. We hailed, good morrow, mother, to a shawl-covered head, a boarding morning paper, which none of us read, and she wept, God bless you, for the apples and pears. And we gave her all our money, but our subway fares. By 1924, really, more like 23, the, the dark, I mean, the, that great moment of her life is really coming to an end. She's then um, about 31 or two years of age. All her romantic relationships have failed in New York. The relationships with women, which have been very important to her, are hidden. Uh, there have been a number of women that she cared about greatly and had relationships with and sexual relationships with in Basser. But, but it was an age that gave extraordinarily little sexual freedom. Whatever freedom she claims, it can never be a visible sexual freedom, and she knows that. And it's hard not to think that that weighed heavily on her. 
By, by the mid-20s, one of the exasperating things to look at in terms of Millet is a medical history which just isn't clear. She really was unwell. She was ill, and her health was failing. Very hard to know what that was. She went through a lot of doctors. There definitely seems to have been some illness and a digestive illness. She, she was not well, and her strength wasn't good. And she marries in, I think, 1923, Eugene Bosvan, who is a coffee importer. And he will become, in many ways, a, a great friend of Malay, but also um, a carer, a minder of Malay. Uh, the marriage is commented on by people and surprises people and, in many ways, disappoints people. And in 1925, they buy a place called Steepletop. It's going to figure greatly in her life. It, it sounds like a very small situation, but it wasn't. It was about 600 acres. It had been a blueberry farm. And Malay, who, who really was that kind of gardener who spoke with such affection and such passion about things, spoke to the garden as its companion, really begins to do serious gardening there. But she writes a poem called Autumn Chant, which is published in uh, The Hop Weaver uh, in, and a later book. And, and it shows this darkening sense of nature. It's also in the garden. Now the autumn shudders and the roses root. Far and wide the ladders lean among the fruit. Now the autumn clambers up the trellised frame and the rose remembers the dust from which it came. Brighter than the blossom on the rose's bough sits the wizened orange, bitter berry now. Beauty never slumbers, all is in her name, but the rose remembers the dust from which it came. One of the great relationships of Millet's life was with her mother, Cora Millet, a very remarkable, um, very vivid woman, and in some ways almost more like a sister to Millet than a mother, and um, she dies in 1931. And Millet writes a beautiful poem, a beautiful dark poem, again, from, uh, in, a, in a book called Wine from These Grapes. Um, and, and here, for the first time, she sees nature as containing her mother and, and the seasons as holding back this thing she loved. Ah, cannot the curled shoots of the larkspur that you loved so, cannot the, the spiny poppy that no winter kills, instruct you how to return through the thawing ground and the thin snow into this April sun that is driving the mist between the hills. A good friend to the monk shroud in a time of need you were and the lupin's friend as well. But I see the lupins lift the ground like a tough weed and the earth over the monk's hood swell. And I fear that not a root in all the heaving sea of land has nudged you where you lie, has found patience and time to direct you, numb and stupid as you still must be, from your first winter ground. The loss of her mother was an enormous, enormous um, uh, loss of hers. I want to finish with, you know, a, a poem and then a comment on Malay, how we think about Malay, because I, I think it's important. Mind the Harvest came out in 1954. It was published uh, four years after Millet's death. Millet had a tragic death. Her 1940s had been shadowed in every possible way, and unfortunately in the middle of the 1940s, when honestly Millet should have been sort of collecting great accolades, that is not what she did. She entered a real shadow world of substance abuse. Um, as you look through the records, Malay was a heavy morphine user, heavy user of, of drugs. They shadowed her life in the mid-40s, um, and with alcohol were extraordinarily dangerous for her and dangerous for her sensibility, and really a tragedy for this wonderfully gifted woman to have slid into these shadows. Um, her, her husband died of lung cancer. I think he died in 49, I, I think 48, he, he became ill. And he had been her companion and her friend and her supporter. 
uh, and he died. And in um, 1950, I think it is, Millet uh, slipped uh, and possibly was drinking um, on a steep uh, stairs in Steepletop, fell down and, and broke her neck and probably died at once. She wasn't found until the next morning. It's a miserable and solitary death for this really great spirit. Um, but before, and, and poems were collected and brought out uh, four years after her death in a book called Mind the Harvest. And I like this poem called Steeple Top. I like this poem particularly in which she goes out and grumbles at the flowers as not really doing what she wants and taking up her time as a poet. It, it illustrates this tremendous companionable feeling she had for what was growing, making herself, you know, at eye level with these flowers and these plants. Even you, sweet basil, even you, lemon verbena, must exert yourselves now and somewhat harden against untimely frost. I have on hovered you and covered you and kept going until I am close to worn out. Now you go about it. I have other things to do, writing poetry, for instance, and I too live in this garden. Nothing could stand all this rain. The lilacs were drowned, browned before I had even smelled them, cool against my cheek, held down a little by my hand. Pain is seldom pre preventable, but is presentable even to strangers on a train. But what the rain does to the lilacs is something you must sigh and try to explain. Borage, forage for bees and for those who love blue. Why must you, having been transplanted from where you were not wanted, either by the bee or by me, from under the sage, engage in this self-destruction? I was tender about your slender taproot. I thought you would send out shoot after shoot of thick cucumber-smelling hairy leaves. But why anybody believes anything, I do not know. I thought I could trust you. Um, that's a wonderful and typical Malay poem about a garden. I wanted to, to, to finish and speak a little bit about Malay. Uh, Malay's executor is here, Holly, and, and I know has done so much. In fact, the Malay estate is one of the very best administered estates. I know that because I had to write for permissions to it and found it a wonderful responsive estate. But I, we had a conversation before uh, this, this lecture, which was really inspiring, as to why somehow Malay hasn't found her place in the pantheon of poets in the way she should have. There's something extremely irritating about that. And you know, there were a couple of terrible essays written about Malay in the 30s. John Crow Ransom wrote, an, who was a fine poet, and usually a fine critic, wrote an extremely eccentric essay. Um, which I think is called Women Poets, I'm not quite sure, which he sort of implied that her brain was not really large enough to be, you know, good at craft or something really, you know, um, sort of terrible about Malay. But what people were really saying is that they didn't see Malay uh, as a greater important poet. And so we have to really think about that. One of the reasons Millet was not perceived, of course, was because she was exceedingly popular. She became the voice of the jazz age. And when modernism came in, they had an enormous suspicion of the popular reader. And when Eliot said it was not a revolt against form, but against dead form, he was thinking about these extremely popular things. But that's really not Millet. M Millet is not a popular poet. There's a psychic terrain in Millet that is really powerful and charged and contradictory. And in her work in the sonnet, and in some of these slight and deceptive lyrics, she maps out a terrain that is extraordinarily important if you want to understand 20th century poetry. And she is a foundational spirit in women's poetry. And, you know, it, it's interesting to me that when we weigh up a poet afterwards, we really have very little criteria to go on. We don't have official criteria. You know, we, we can break our hearts academicizing poetry and talk about it. 
But there is one elusive and unusual criteria that people don't always get. You know, there is the poet and they write the poems, but then there is the witness that a poet gives to poetry. And Malay gave an absolutely stellar witness to poetry. She lived that life, she was that life, the poetry she wrote, the best of it, reports on that life. And that isn't always true of poets. They can write some beautiful poems, but they don't always give that witness, but Malay gives that witness. And somehow we have to find a way of thinking about poetry so that we honor the poet and we honor the witness. And that's why I have been so honored today to be here, because I was thinking as I came here, you know, Malay went through a lot. I cannot imagine anything she would have liked better than this walk in the Botanic Gardens to honor her. So thank you very much.